Hi, this is Professor Unmark, and this is a narrated PowerPoint presentation on the Free Exercise Clause. The Free Exercise Clause is the second of the religious clauses in the Constitution, and it essentially says that you have a right as a person in America to freely practice your religion. It's not an absolute right. There are times when the government can legitimately step in and stop you from exercising your religious liberty in particular ways, but the right is pretty expansive. Um, an example of something that would not be allowed would be ritual human sacrifice. We don't allow that. So even though it says there can be no law infringing on the right of, to freely practice your religion, that doesn't mean it's an absolute right. And the questions that come up under the free exercise clause involve some really important considerations of when is it legitimate for the government to interfere with somebody's religious practice and when is it not and uh, so that's what we're going to look at there's three broad questions that arise under the free exercise clause and we'll touch on each of these as we go through this powerpoint presentation to what extent should people be allowed to refuse to comply with the law because of their religious beliefs? So if the law says you have to accept work that's offered to you if you want to continue to uh, collect unemployment benefits. Well, what if the only work that you get offered is work that requires you to work on um, what you consider to be the Sabbath? Or, what if, if the law says that you can't discriminate against certain groups of people, what if you have a religious belief that says you can't um, participate in a same-sex marriage, for example? To what extent should people be allowed to refuse to comply with the law because of their religious beliefs? How are judges to decide which religious behaviors constitute such a demonstrable harm that they can be regulated or punished, right? So if the law prohibits people from doing something, like killing people, and a religious organization wants to kill people as part of their practice, that's a pretty obvious, um, you're not going to be allowed to do that situation. But other things are maybe not quite so clear cut. What about um, religious practices that involve animal sacrifice? What about religious practices that involve um, snake charming or something like that? There are questions that come up before the court every once in a while where somebody is being punished for a behavior that is part of their religious practice. And the question is, who gets to decide whether or not a religious practice can be uh, punished? And sort of similarly to this, if the government is going to exempt religious practice from ordinary laws, if the government is going to choose to do that as a matter of policy, who gets to decide whether a religious belief is sincerely held or whether a religious practice is a fundamental aspect of that religion? Sometimes the law, um, the courts have said a minor infringement on somebody's religious freedom is not necessarily something that the government would be prohibited from doing, but the government can't infringe on the fundamental aspects of people's religion. And the question is, well, who gets to decide what's a really important part of a religion and what's not? Um, I think most people are a little bit uncomfortable in the United States having the government decide that. It sort of brings up questions of separation of church and state. So these are really interesting and important questions. And we'll look at some court cases that have arisen uh, under these questions. Uh, the first one we can look at, and, and it ties into the first two, is um, a very early case arising under the Free Exercise Clause. And I should point out that there aren't a lot of early cases. Most of the um, government 
interaction <laughs> with the free exercise clause comes in the 20th century. But this is a, a case that came to the court in the 19th century in 1879, a case called Reynolds versus the United States. And the case involved whether or not the government could legitimately uh, ban the Mormon at the time, the Mormon practice of polygamy. It was a part of the Mormon faith for uh, parts of its early existence that to the extent that a man could, he was obligated to have more than one wife. As a condition of allowing or even considering allowing Utah to become a state, the Mormon church was asked to renounce that. And a case arose under this situation, this discussion that was going on around whether or not um, the government could essentially ban polygamy in the states or in the territories. And the case came before the court in um, 1879 called Reynolds versus the United States. And the Supreme Court upheld the law banning polygamy. And essentially what the court said is, it's really not the government's place to regulate belief, like what you believe in. But the government can, under certain circumstances, proscribe or prohibit certain practices. So the big question under the Establishment Clause often is, what sorts of practices are within the government's purview to prohibit or punish. In the modern times, we would generally expect that the law would not prescribe religious practices unless the government could demonstrate that those practices were causing some sort of harm to somebody else or interfering with a really, really important government purpose, like fighting a war or educating children or something like that. But this is a quote that came from Reynolds versus the United States. Can a man excuse his practices to the contrary of the law because of his religious beliefs? In other words, can people just ignore the law because it it's against their religious belief? To permit this, the court said, would be to make the professed doctrines of religion superior to the law of the land and in effect to permit every citizen to become a law unto himself. So in Reynolds versus the United States, the Supreme Court said religious belief is protected, but aspects of that belief that are manifested in practice might be punishable. And in the case of Reynolds versus the United States, the court said the government has a legitimate interest in preventing polygamy. You can read the case for yourself and decide whether or not you think that the government's justification was something that we would accept for uh, today. So I want to talk a little bit about how we define religion in the law. If we're going to make an exemption for religion, how do you um, define religion. And I'll give you an example of when this comes up. Um, it comes up in particular when we talk about um, the draft. It's, it's come up a bunch of times when we talk about the draft and the question of who gets to get out of the draft because of um, religious objections or more broadly speaking, who gets to be a conscientious objector when it comes to war. And a lot of these cases arise, um, some of these cases arise out of the Vietnam War. Um, our most recent uh, military action in which there was a draft. Right now we don't have a draft. So if anybody joins the military, the presumption is they're willing to go to war if necessary. But when there's a draft, people don't have any choice. Young men don't have any choice whether they go into the military or not. And so some questions have come up um, regarding this, and I'll share with you. Some of this is in the reading that I assigned for this week, and some of it is not. So generally speaking, when when the, the law is defining religion, so for the ex example of when you get to be a conscientious objector, it's, it's based on a belief in something like a supreme being or something of parallel importance to the, to the believer. So um, be, becoming exempt from something based on religious belief 
doesn't always have to be what we would traditionally think of as a religious belief, a belief in some sort of higher being. Um, it can be, in some circumstances, a sincerely held philosophical belief that is sincere in the way that a religious person might be sincere in their religious beliefs. Um, that standard came about from a 1965 case called U.S. versus Seeger. Daniel Seeger um, applied for an exemption to the draft based on his sincerely held philosophical belief after having studied philosophers such as Aristotle and Spinoza and other research and reading that he had done had led him to conclude that um, for him individually to participate in a war would be uh, immoral. And at the time, the, the uh, draft, the law that authorized the draft, the law that authorized the military draft has a, it still does, has a provision in there for people who have a sincerely held religious belief that is tied to the belief in a su supreme being. Well, Daniel Seeger was agnostic with regard to whether or not there was a God, but he had a sincerely held belief based on his philosophical beliefs and his training in philosophy that it would be wrong for him to participate in any war, to um, be in the military. And the US uh, government wanted him to be drafted. They didn't want to give him an exemption. And he won. Um, in 1965, the Supreme Court sided with Seeger. And they said, what we're really looking to protect is the sincere and meaningful belief that is important to someone in a way that religion is acknowledged to be important to religious people. And um, it doesn't have to be belief in God. It doesn't have to be membership in a sort of traditionally accepted religion. On the other hand, there's limits to that. <laughs> the court ruled in 1971 in a case called Gillette versus the United States that this doesn't apply to objection to a particular war. It only applies to a sincerely held objection to fighting wars in general. Uh, Gillette had an opposition to the Vietnam War in particular, but he admitted that he wasn't really a conscientious objector in the sense that he wouldn't be willing to fight in a war he thought was just. He just wouldn't be willing to fight in a war that he thought was unjust. And the Supreme Court said, uh, you don't get to make that distinction for yourself. So um, it's... That's an example of when this might come up. Generally speaking, when we look at things like the tax code, when an organization wants to be recognized as a religion for purposes of being exempt from paying taxes or having to follow um, certain kinds of laws like uh, anti-discrimination laws about uh, gender discrimination, etc. So, for example, in the Catholic Church, women can't become priests. Right. So we have general laws that say an employer can't discriminate on the basis of gender, but we exempt religious organizations from some of those, not all of them, but some of those laws. And so generally speaking, in, in the tax code, you'll find references um, to defining a religion more more generally or I guess in some ways more specifically than for the draft that um, generally speaking, recognized religions involve a moral code that's not subjective. In other words, the, the religion has teachings in it about how one should behave toward other people. Um, it may have um, requirements to worship in a certain way or to abstain from alcohol or to abstain from um, dancing or you know whatever involves a moral code, reg regulating behavior that is not subjective. In other words, do this if you feel like it, but don't do it if you don't feel like it. The, um, the religion generally is recognized as having associational ties. In other words, there are people who share the beliefs and come together in some way to celebrate those reliefs, beliefs or worship. They take care of one another. They um, are members of the same, say, congregation or uh, temple or mosque or um, associational group. Um, 
it includes a dem demonstrable sincerity of belief and uh, usually some sort of hierarchy where there's uh, teachings, there's people who are leaders of the religion who then share um, and, and teach people uh, how to be adherents to, to that religion. And so there are some, if, if somebody is asking for an exemption to the law because they are a religious organization, these are the kinds of things that the government is going to want to see evidence of. It wouldn't be something like this. Um, and I can't take you to this link because um, the links when you're doing a narrated PowerPoint, but this I'll, you, I'll, I'll link it in the, in the canvas. This is an organization, Vengaza.org is actually where you'll find information about a fake religion called the uh, Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. And this is an organization that is, exists mostly to poke fun at organized religion. And so they, um, claim to be uh, worship the flying spaghetti monster. They call themselves Pastafarians, and um, and they mostly poke fun at organized religion. Well, they're not. They don't have a demonstrably sincere belief in the flying spaghetti monster, and they acknowledge that it's a satire thing. They don't have a moral code that um, that people have to follow other than worshiping the flying spaghetti monster. So defining gen, uh, religion more generally, mostly for purposes of uh, exemptions from federal laws that apply to other organizations, tax laws and, and that kind of thing. So one of the things that the court has had to grapple with is under what conditions can the government force people or compel people to engage in behavior that goes against their religious teachings. Now, this isn't as clear cut as it may seem. And we'll, we're gonna go into this in a fair amount of detail in a few minutes, but I wanted to point out to you that this debate started, when was the 1940s, 80 years ago? Something like that, I'm not very good at math. Um, but I'll give you a couple of examples where the court made a ruling and then just a few years later said, ah, that was the wrong ruling. We shouldn't have ruled that way. Um, and, and it has to do with these two cases, Minersville versus Govitis and West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, had to do with whether or not the government could require school children to salute the flag and, and do the Pledge of Allegiance, say the Pledge of Allegiance. And, and again, 1940s were, it's a wartime. Right, so there's the government has an interest in promoting patriotism and promoting love of country. And so they pass a law that says everybody has to say the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of every school day. And in Minersville versus Gobitis, the Supreme Court upheld that law. They said, you know, the government's interest in promoting patriotism overrides the religious objection of, um, say, Seventh day Adventists or Jehovah's Witnesses who object to uh, pledging allegiance to things like the flag, it goes against their religion, doesn't mean they're not patriotic Americans, just means part of their religion prohibits them from um, engaging, pledging to anything uh, like, like a flag. And the court said, that's a minor infringement on your religion. So if your kids go to school, then they have to salute the flag. Just three years later, just three years later, very quickly, in West Virginia versus Barnett, the court reversed itself. They said, you know what? That, that decision was wrong. We really don't have the right to impose on people's sincerely held religious beliefs unless the government's purpose is a compelling one. And yeah, it's nice for people to be patriotic, but that's not really a compelling government interest, something that the government can't function properly without uh, being able to do this. And so uh, the court in 1943 said, we are gonna hold the government to a much higher standard than just, hey, we think this is a good idea before we allow the government to pass laws that compel people to engage in behavior that goes against their religious teachings. One of the most recent cases that has come before the court 
is this case masterpiece cake shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission that was decided in 2018. And the reason I, th this decision was a little bit complicated because it involved First Amendment rights, it involved 14th Amendment rights, and it sort of involved religious liberty as well. But it was a really controversial decision that's really recent uh, in terms of the court's history. And this case involved a guy by the name of Jack Phillips who owns a cake shop in Colorado called the Masterpiece Cake Shop. And he came in conflict with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. So under Colorado law, it is illegal for anybody to discriminate in, uh, in their business practices against members of the LGBT community. And so what you had here, you had Jack Phillips who said his religious beliefs, his sincerely held religious beliefs um, prohibited, him, prohibited him from making a cake to celebrate a same-sex wedding. Um, he said, I will sell you a cake that I just made, a generic cake that I made, and you can use it in your wedding, but I will not make a bespoke cake for your wedding, specifically for your wedding. And the Colorado Civil Rights Commission said that he had to, right? So you had a conflict. You had a conflict between um, a gay couple who wanted their rights to purchase a product, um, just like any other couple would purchase a product, they wanted their rights protected, and Jack Phillips wanted his religious liberty protected, and he didn't want to be compelled to do something that violated his religious beliefs. And in a somewhat complicated decision, the Supreme Court upheld um, his right to refuse to not to sell, they didn't say he could refuse to serve gay couples. They said he could refuse to um, be required to use his artistic talents to create a cake specifically for their wedding. If they wanted to buy a cake and then have somebody else decorate it or whatever, he they could certainly do that. Um, it was a bit, kind of a complicated decision, but it, it just goes to show you that a decision made in 1943 doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the end of the discussion, right? We can have a lot more discussion about things. This was a very complicated and controversial decision. So essentially when it comes to the Establishment Clause, there are two competing approaches. There's a competing approach that was in place from say 1943 up until the 1990s, really, so for a very long time, the prominent uh, approach that the court used was a, an approach that we call accommodation, which essentially says that um, people have to be exempt from laws that apply to everybody else in order to accommodate their religion, unless the government has a compelling interest in um, not accommodating them. The, um, it's a it's a very high standard for the government to meet. That standard changed in 1991 to a standard that sometimes we call referred to as the secular regulation rule or the secular regulation standard. Again, remember secular means non-religious. So under the accommodation standard, which was in place essentially from 1943 until 1991, the government could only compel people or infringe on people's individual um, practices, not their beliefs, but their religious practices, if the government's interest was compelling. And this introduces a standard, a legal standard, that is referred to as strict scrutiny. And essentially what that means is that when there is a law and somebody has um, challenged that law as unconstitutional, if that law potentially violates somebody's fundamental liberty, like the law discriminates on the basis of religion, then the government has a very, very high standard to meet before that law will be upheld. The, the law will be found unconstitutional, in other words, unless the government can demonstrate that its need, that it, the reason it, it passed that law is so important that it cannot be asked to exempt somebody just because of their religion. It's a really, really high standard for the government to meet, and the government almost never meets it. So under the accommodation standard, 
religious liberty is really broadly protected. The cases that are most closely associated with this um, are two cases that are referenced in the reading that I assigned for you for this week. One's called Sherbert versus Werner, and the other is called Wisconsin versus Yoder. In Sherbert versus Werner, the question was whether or not the government has a compelling interest in stopping fraud um, that would buy, that would override Sherbert's uh, religious liberty to uh, not work on the Sabbath. So uh, Seventh-day Adventists, Sherbert was a Seventh-day Adventist, their Sabbath is the Saturday. So Sherbert uh, was uh, out of work and applying for unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance is a government program, and it usually requires that you accept work if it's offered to you. If it's a job that you're qualified to do and somebody offers you work, then you have to take the job. You can't just keep getting unemployment benefits. Well, Sherbert was offered work, but it was work that would have required her to work on a Saturday. And so she turned the work down and uh, the state denied her unemployment claim because they said she could have taken the job. And she said, well, I can't take the job because that would require me to violate my religious beliefs. And the state argued that it's really important that they not that people not be able to just claim a religious exemption so they can keep getting unemployment insurance. They were worried about fraud. And the government said, well, there are lots of ways you can stop fraud. There is investigations you can do. You're, you don't need a blanket, you don't need a, 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 a law that is so strict that you don't have to make any exceptions for anybody. You can still keep fraud at bay and accommodate her religious beliefs. There aren't that many Seventh-day Adventists who are going to claim that they that they can't work on Saturdays. So the um, Sherbert won that case. The case that came to the court in 1971 is called Wisconsin versus Yoder. And this actually did involve a government program that is considered compelling. And that is the government's interest in educating the children of the state. Education is one of the most important things state government does. So clearly the government has a compelling interest in making sure kids get a good general education. This standard, um, the, in the state of Wisconsin, what that meant was that you had to send your kids, your kids had to go to school through 10th grade. That's about when you're like 16, I guess, you can drop out of school. The Yoder family is Amish. And in the Amish faith, parents take their kids out of school after eighth grade, and then they continue their education at home, mostly in vocational training to work on the family farm or to work in family run businesses. The state of Wisconsin um, refused to accommodate the Yoder family's request that they be allowed to take their kids out of school after eighth grade. And so the case came before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court sided with the Yoder family. They said, yes, the government's interest in general is compelling. But in this particular interest, one, the Amish community is very small. So it's not like there are going to be a bunch of uneducated kids running around Wisconsin. The, the Amish community is a very insular community. And being able to keep their children out of school to keep them from being overly influenced by non-religious or secular matters is a fundamental, really important part of the Amish faith. And so the, um, the government was required to accommodate in, in this instance. Here's an example. I want to give you an example of where the government was not required to accommodate. And that was um, a case called Bob Jones University versus the United States. It's my understanding that Bob Jones University, which is a religious private school, has changed some of its policies. But in 1983, they had a policy that prohibited uh, interracial dating on their of their students. And that policy fell afoul of federal law that says you can't discriminate on the basis of race, the Civil Rights Act of 1965. And so the... Um, U.S. government told 
Bob Jones University that they would no longer be tax exempt because the, um, the law says you can't claim a tax exemption if you're an organization that discriminates on the basis of race, um, it, they would have to pay some taxes. They would, they would not be exempt from part of the tax code. And Bob Jones University uh, sued and, and, and wanted the government to be required to accommodate their religious um, objection to interracial dating. And the Supreme Court ruled that the U.S. government's interest in promoting racial tolerance was overrides the it, it, the um, Bob Jones University policy that it's not um, I think part of the ruling was that it's not a com it's not a generally accepted part of the Christian faith in general that you can't um, have interracial dating and so the but the government's interest in um, promoting racial tolerance and avoiding discrimination actually is compelling, the government said. And so there's lots of cases that come up, but in general, um, the government for a long time in our history um, followed this sort of accommodation standard unless the government's interest could be shown to override or in, unless the um, religious organization was claiming um, a religious exemption based on something that wasn't held by the court to be a fundamental aspect of their religious practice. All of that changed in 1991 uh, in a case called Oregon versus Smith, 1990, sorry. Um, this was a really important case and a really controversial case. Oh my God, so controversial. In Oregon versus Smith, the question was whether or not the state of Oregon could deny unemployment benefits to Mr. Smith, who was fired from his job because he engaged in a Native American religious practice of smoking a hallucinogenic drug called peyote, which was illegal under Oregon law. Peyote was illegal under Oregon law and there was no religious exemption. There now is, but at the time there was no religious exemption. And so Smith filed suit expecting to be treated just like the Amish were treated in Wisconsin versus Yoder, that the state has an interest in keeping people from doing drugs, but the native tribes, it's a really important part of their religious practice that they use peyote. And so um, he said, you know, based on the standard that the court has used in the past, he should be given an exemption and allowed to um, collect unemployment insurance. But the Supreme Court did not side with Smith. They sided with Oregon. And essentially what they said is that the government's interest in regulating behavior doesn't have to be compelling. It's enough that the government has a legitimate interest in this case, even if the government's interest in um, prohibiting people from taking peyote isn't compelling because not very many people take peyote. The government's interest is important. Stopping illegal drugs and drug use is important. And that in, is enough to justify the government punishing somebody who breaks the law because of their religious beliefs. The court said laws that apply to everybody generally, that don't single out religious people, that aren't hostile to a particular religion in the law, they don't have to make an accommodation. If you're a religious person, or if you are generally in favor of a broad interpretation of the First Amendment, this is a really, this decision is going to freak you out. And it did. It totally freaked out everybody in the religious liberties sphere. It, I mean, some groups welcomed it, but most religious groups felt that this was a decision that was... Um, essentially relegating religious belief to sort of second-class citizenship. It's super, super controversial decision. So in 1990, the court made this decision. I want to contrast this with a decision that they made in 1993, just to show you that when the court makes a ruling, that doesn't necessarily mean people can get away with doing things that are not 
consistent with the ruling. So in this case, this case is uh, Lukumi versus Hialeah. Lukumi is short for um, a religious organization uh, in Florida, mostly based in Florida. It's a it's a Caribbean-based religion that practices, it's called Santeria, and they practice ritual animal sacrifice. They don't practice human sacrifice. They sacrifice goats and chickens, mostly. And the city of Hialeah passed an ordinance prohibiting that. But they didn't pass an ordinance that prohibited any other kind of animal slaughter. You could have a slaughterhouse and kill animals. You could have a restaurant that serves, uh, that allows people to pick out the fish that they want to have killed and served up to them. Uh, and the animal control facility was allowed to euthanize dogs and cats that nobody was adopting, but the church was prohibited from practicing ritual animal sacrifice. And in 1993, the court said, that's not what we meant in Oregon versus Smith. We did not say that you could single out religion for hostile treatment. And in this case, this was not a generally applicable law that applied to everybody who wanted to kill an animal in the city limits of Hialeah, Florida. It only applied to the animal sacrifice that the Santeria religion wanted to practice. And it was based on the fact that the majority of the people in Hialeah don't like animal sacrifice. And they, they just discounted the Church of Lukumi's sincerely held religious beliefs and said, basically, well, that's not part of our religion, so it can't be very important. And the court said, you don't get to decide that as a majority. You don't get to decide that somebody's religion isn't important because it's not your religion. So this decision was a welcome decision, but Oregon versus Smith was a super, super controversial decision. And so as a result of what happened in 1990, was a huge push for Congress to pass a law to overturn Oregon versus Smith, to basically tell the Supreme Court, you can't, you can't have that ruling. Um, and so Congress stepped in, and in 1993, Congress passed a law called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It's usually referred to as RFRA. They usually shorten it to its initials. And essentially what this law attempted to do for federal, state, and local government was um, turn the clock back and require the court to adopt that compelling government interest strict scrutiny standard. They wanted to legislatively overturn Oregon versus Smith and tell the court to go back to requiring accommodation unless the government has a compelling government interest that would allow them to override the religious organization's religious liberty. That was a controversial law. It was enacted in 1993, and there have been a lot of cases that have come before the court um, under this act. I'll give you a couple of examples of how that has played out. The, probably the most important one is a 1997 case called Bourne versus Flores. So Bourne is a, a city in Texas, and Flores was the archbishop of um, the diocese uh, in Bourne. Uh, Florida, I mean, in Bourne, Texas, and the um, the church wanted to expand their, they wanted to expand their church building because they said that their congregation had outgrown the facility and they wouldn't be able to have their, um, all of their congregation come to the services if they weren't allowed to expand. Unfortunately for Flores, um, the church is located in a historic preservation district and so there's regulations in place that restrict what kind of building you can do um, and so the religious liberty claim came into conflict with the historic preservation code and um, when the supreme court ruled on this decision in born versus flores what they essentially said was Congress can make laws that apply to the federal government, but Congress can't tell the Supreme Court or local governments how the law applies to local government. So 
in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, what Congress had said was that they had the authority under the 14th Amendment to enforce their law on the states because of the way Congress interpreted that provision in the 14th Amendment. And that got the court bad. And they said, hey, it's not Congress's job to interpret the 14th Amendment. That's our job. And what they said in Warren versus Flores is, we will allow that Congress has the authority to direct the Supreme Court to use the strict scrutiny standard for federal laws, but not for state and local laws. So um, the church laws in Warren versus Flores. And it's, it's re, after Warren versus Flores and between then and about 2015, I think is the last time it happened, states began to adopt their own Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So something like, I can't remember, I think it's 21 states or 36 states or something like that have Religious Freedom Restoration Acts regulating um, state and local governments. So um, Born versus Flores is a really important case for kind of kickstarting that. In an example of be careful what you wish for, in 2006, the Supreme Court upheld the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as it applied to Congress and federal law and protected the Espirita Beneficiente um, religious organization against the United States government. This is, uh, Gonzalez was the attorney general at the time. And so here's the issue. This church is a very small church. I think they have like five members, but they are the um, New Mexico branch of a church that originates, originated in Brazil. And as part of their religious practice, they drink a hallucinogenic tea called ayahuasca. One of the chemical components of this hallucinogenic tea is a banned substance on the federal banned substance list. So it's illegal to import it into the United States or, or to use it. And so the attorney general, um, the Justice Department, told this church that they could know that they were breaking federal law by importing this tea. And the church shot back at the federal government, hey, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, you can only tell us we're not allowed to drink our tea if you've got a compelling government interest. So demonstrate that telling five people they can't drink a hallucinogenic tea will stop you from keeping illegal drugs from coming into the country. And they asked for an accommodation under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which said you get an accommodation unless the government can't do their job without infringing on your rights. And in 2006, the Supreme Court said, well, we're going to apply the standard Congress told us to apply, so the church wins. And so Congress was like, Arr! but they lost anyway. Um, and so that's, it's an interesting case for that reason, mostly for that reason. It's an interesting case. More recently, uh, the court has ruled in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby in 2014 that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act requires the Affordable Care Act, the government under the Affordable Care Act, to exempt um, organization um, businesses that are owned by religious people from um, the provision of the Affordable Care Act that says that the health care programs that you give your employees have to include certain kinds of contraception. Um, the, um, the Affordable Care Act already had an exemption in it for religious organizations and for um, nonprofit companies that were not publicly traded, uh, that were not public, like open to the public. Um, Hobby Lobby is a family-owned business that's open to the public. I mean, they're you can go shop at Hobby Lobby and buy yarn and stuff at Hobby Lobby. And so the, the Green family who owns Hobby Lobby asked for the religious exemption to be extended to for-profit companies that are uh, not traded on the stock market, but that are open to the public. And in 2014, the Supreme Court ruled that um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act requires that. And so Hobby Lobby doesn't have to um, provide its employees with 
contraception under the Affordable Care Act. So that's one law that happened. And then lots of states have their own Religious Freedom Restoration Acts. A lot of the Religious Freedom Restoration Restoration Acts at the state level came about as more and more states began to recognize same-sex marriage. And then, of course, when the Supreme Court ruled in Obergefell versus Hodges that same-sex marriage is a right, um, religious organizations that oppose same-sex marriage wanted to put laws in place that would allow religious organizations to um, refuse to comply with laws based on opposition to same-sex relationships. Um, and so we're seeing some of those cases come before the court uh, in little by little as, as these conflicts in rights show up in, in court cases. The second act that was recently passed, congressional act that was recently passed um, with the intention of expanding religious liberty and restricting the ways the government can infringe on people's religious liberty is called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. And it essentially says that um, organizations like state prisons or local prisons or federal prisons that get money from the federal government to um, run their uh, prisons, right? The federal government funds a lot of things. They might give a certain amount of money to states to have their um, prison systems. And also um, any federal lands or programs that are being done on public lands have to accommodate people's religious practices in order to continue to receive um, federal government funding. And that is designed to make sure that people who are in prison can still practice their religion, et cetera. And um, the most recent case that's come before the court um, under this law is a case called Holt versus Hobbs, which was decided in 2015 that involved a Muslim, a Muslim inmate who wanted to grow a beard. And the state prison had a policy that said you can have a beard, but it can only be a quarter of an inch long if you're a prisoner. And the prisoner argued that he needed to be able to grow his beard to a half an inch because it, it because his religion required that more of his space be covered with the beard. And the church, I mean, the, the prison said, no, we don't accommodate you. They said, we've already accommodated you. We gave you prayer mats. We don't feed you pork. We let you um, pray five times a day. And that's about all the accommodation we want to do. And they also argued that um, they needed to have these restrictions on facial hair in place to keep people from um, smuggling in contraband, like if a person comes to visit them, maybe would hand them a razor blade or something and they'd stick it in their beard and, or drugs or something like that. Um, and uh, so the, the um, prison said, ah, we really need for public safety, which is compelling, got to have people safe in the prisons. We, we've got to be able to keep control of the prisoners and we shouldn't um, be it required to make this accommodation. But the Supreme Court sided with the prisoner. They said, look, Congress passed this law and the law says that unless you have a compelling interest, you, you have to accommodate. They're going back again toward this accommodation standard. And the court said the, the prison's interest in differentiating between a quarter of an inch and a half inch is just not, it doesn't make any sense. Nobody can stick something in a half inch beard that they couldn't stick in a quarter inch beard. And it, and it doesn't make any sense. Their, their argument uh, is not compelling to, to us. And so in its, even though the court in 1990 made this decision in Oregon versus Smith that caused a lot of conflict, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, and the court becoming more conservative on issues of, uh, of religious liberty has pushed us back toward a more accommodationist perspective. And where this is really going to play out, and at some point it's going to come to a head and the court's going to have to make some really important decisions, is what happens when people's rights collide. The rights of especially LGBTQ community 
to be treated fairly and to and to be treated equally in society versus religious organizations desires to uh, not provide services to um, same-sex couples the the masterpiece cake decision didn't really get to the heart of the question they decided the case on on somewhat different grounds but it it's it illustrates what's going to be coming um, to the court in uh, in the next few years probably it will continue to be an ongoing issue under the free exercise clause but is the map that shows um, as of 2015 is the last time a state adopted a religious freedom restoration act so you can see which states have adopted religious freedom restoration acts and which states haven't so you can see most of the more conservative states in the country have adopted them. Most of the more liberal states um, have not. Um, Pennsylvania is a little on the conservative side. It's, it wouldn't be considered a hugely con conservative state. Idaho is pretty conservative, and then a lot of the South is, is pretty conservative. So anyway, that's my spiel. Took a lot longer than I thought. I, I do apologize. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye.